I'm unmuted. Can you all hear me? I can't hear you, so thanks for the claps that I just saw. This is my debut of telling my story. I have given some history talks on Zoom, but talking to yourself into a computer is not my idea of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I'm thrilled we have Zoom. Um, it allows that circle of unity to be a very big circle at this time. So hola to the people that are in Mexico. And uh, uh, it's just nice. We've, I've got a gal here that's from Australia that's tuned in tonight. And uh, it's kind of exciting. It's part of our history. It's, it's a new, uh, I'm proud of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm proud of how we've risen up through the pandemic and found ways to stay connected and to carry the message to one another. It just shows the resilience um, of AA. And I sometimes picture Bob and Bill looking down on us with a big grin saying, oh my God, Bob, did you ever think that this would ever happen? Anyway, I'm here tonight to tell my story because in 45 minutes, I can't do our history justice. But um, I, I might throw in a little at the end if I time it pretty well. Um, I wanna start out by saying that my sobriety date is May 13th of 1978. And why I know, I just saw, thank you, oh, Susan, I saw you clap. Thank you, thank you, I got that. Um, I feel like I'm on Hollywood Squares. I did a thing uh, not too long ago with Billy Noonan and uh, uh, Michelle, the archivist from the office, and I was in this square and people started asking me questions and I just felt like Paul Lynn on Hollywood Squares, but, uh, but thank you anyway. So um, yeah, I came in in 78. But where did I come in? I came in in Akron, Ohio. And I was young and single. And I, um, the program itself was only 43 years old. Um, the vibration in the rooms that I came into was incredible because even though Dr. Bob had died in 1950, a lot of those old timers were still there. And uh, Ray could have testified to that because we, we used to interview them. and. Um, uh, it, 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 I still miss them. I carry them with me. And um, I came into King's School, which was group number one within my first week of sobriety. And, be, and uh, I'm broadcasting live from Florida right now because the pandemic, I didn't go back to Akron. I winter in Florida. I usually go back to Akron and do archival and history work there. But because the pandemic, I'm here. But you know what? Because of Zoom, I met my home group every Wednesday night, which is group number one, Bob and Ann's group. And I, and I just want to invite you to come if you'd like. It is the mother group. It's probably at the same time on a Wednesday, though, that you're holding the Covina uh, message. But um, it's very cool because we had a speaker from Australia speaking now, Australia and Wales and all these countries are joining us. And it's, it's just awesome. It's just awesome. So uh, that's my home group. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I'm the oldest of six children out of six kids. Five of us probably qualify for this program. My sister may be on this call. She's got over 30 years of sobriety. So it's a family disease. If, if you shook my family tree, an alcoholic would fall from every limb. Um, I grew up under the influence of people under the influence. And in our home, our lives revolved around alcohol. It was, a tri it was like tribal, it was tribal. And um, so um, at the age of 14, I picked up my first drink. I couldn't wait to join the tribe. Uh, you know, I pictured myself with a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other. Life of the party, party girl. Um, those were my goals. Uh, I thought life should be a party. And so at the age of 14, I'd have to say um, that all the ingredients of my alcoholism was in there on the first drink. I had the phenomenon of craving. I, um, I, snuck, I snuck a little bit from every bottle in the house because I didn't want to get caught. And uh, then alcohol lied to me like it often would, and it told me I was fine when I wasn't. And I uh, was babysitting for my parents at that time. And when they brought company home, uh, and they introduced me, I was weaving back and forth and got slapped and sent to bed. But that didn't stop me. That consequence, that emotional hangover, that shame did not stop me because from that moment on, my life would revolve around alcohol. I would drink every chance I could. Um, I didn't get into a, a lot of um, 
oh gosh, I just, I didn't have a lot of the kind of consequences a lot of people have. I kind of lived a double life. I was a school teacher. I was like a school teacher by day and a drunk by night. And you could almost see me change in a phone booth. I mean, really, I was leading two lives. And when you have a public life as a teacher, the last thing you want is the parents of your school to see what you do on weekends. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever lived that double life, but um, that was one of the prices that I paid. Um, everything that mattered to me was on the outside. Um, I didn't, I don't think I even knew I had a self. You know, when people talk about self, uh, I don't know that I was aware I had a self. Um, although I did get excited if I got junk mail because at least Sears knew I existed. Um, but I really, I really had a bad connection with me. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't go to jail. I, I've never been arrested. Um, I was a party girl and I suffered a whole lot of hangovers and a whole lot of wasted time feeling sick. You know, Dr. Bob, I always want to read Dr. Bob and the good old timers is he'd be in bed for months and I wasn't in bed for months, but I get it coming off a, a drinking. I would like live to drink and Friday was the big night. And then I would be sick Saturday and Sunday and I'd just start feeling better by Monday. And then I'd be focusing again because if I wasn't drinking, I was thinking about drinking. So my, so basically my problem isn't just alcohol. I didn't know it at the time. Well, I have a thinking problem. Um, and that to me, and I didn't know I had a thinking problem. I had, I thought I was all right because, you know, before I came in the program, gosh, I had a, a brand new car. I had a master's degree. I had my own home and women back then didn't own their own home. I had a good job, didn't look like an alcoholic. But um, gosh, when I look back now, it's a good thing I didn't know how sick I was. Uh, that might've been too much for me to, to know that. Um, one of the things I was full of, uh, full of is fear and self-pity. Uh, and um, I had this thing called victim thinking I always saw myself as a victim and I blamed others for my unhappiness. You know, in the uh, chapter to um, uh, the doctor's opinion, in the doctor's opinion. You know, to me, the alcoholic life was the only normal one. And I was um, angry and irritable and I uh, blamed everyone else and I had this suitcase that I carried around with me and in it because I did not know how to resolve conflict. I, I collected uh, resentment and I had a way of looking at it. There's a way I did that. The way I did it was if something happened, I told myself a story about what happened and it was always from that victim perspective. It was like if there was a glass of water, I would see that glass of water as half empty rather than half full. Um, you know, I couldn't cope. Um, my suitcase was full of the past and I always wanted to tell you all about it. And if you tried to tell me of some of the hurts in your life, it's almost like I had pride about the hurts in mine. I would try to top you. I'd say, oh, that's nothing. Wait till I tell you how bad my story is. So it was kind of a sick way of processing my life and almost a sick pride in it um, that, that made me miserable my thinking made me miserable. And the only thing that allowed me to escape, even though I had been raised a Catholic and had gone to Catholic school for eight years, I had memorized all those paragraphs. I don't know if any of you are um, uh, recovering Catholics, um, but uh, I memorized all those paragraphs. I see, see okay. Um, and, uh, you know, back then we memorized and I did not have a personal relationship with God. So I lived kind of a life of despair. And the other thing I meant to say in this uh, uh, alcoholic family I grew up in is uh, I was the black sheep and I, and I didn't know why. Um, I, my family kind of cast me out and I wanted to be accepted by my family. So I tried to do a lot of things. And so I thought, you know, I bet if I was perfect, if I could just be perfect, then they would accept me. So it was like chasing a carrot that I could never get. I could never, no matter what I did, it was like I was either too much or not enough. 
And so um, I probably carried a lot of self-hatred with that too. And so I, I tell you that because that is a big part of my story, especially looking back at, at how miserable and pathetic I was because I didn't have a design for living. I didn't have a higher power. I didn't have trust and hope or anything about the things that were happening. Life happened to me, not for me. And it was always like, you know, I think we talk about it, the impending doom. It's sort of like Jaws music was always playing. Doom, 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 you know. And again, to wrestle those fears and to get free of, of the bondage of self, alcohol was how I did that and it would relieve the stress. I, had, I don't think I had another tool in the box, to be honest with you. That was pretty much it. Um, and so um, I went out drinking one night, not, nothing unusual. I'd started having blackouts, but this particular night, um, you know, like the things that happened to me were like one time when I was drinking at the, remember drive-in? Some of you probably, I don't know, some people may have never been to a drive-in. Those are great places to drink, weren't they? And, uh, <laughs> and so um, I, I needed to go to the restroom. And so I left Ed in the car and I went to the restroom. And when I came back and I got in the front seat, Ed wasn't there, but I sat there anyway. And all of a sudden in my foggy, hazy, drunkenness, I looked down and saw a plastic Jesus on the dashboard, and I thought, hmm, Ed didn't have a plastic Jesus. And then the couple from the back seat tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're in the wrong car. Um, crazy, crazy stuff I would do. It's a wonder more didn't happen to me. Um, I would go out drinking, get myself all fixed up, all gussied up, you know. I, I didn't go out to have a drink, by the way. I went out drinking. And I would sit at this place, Ray will know this place, the bucket shop. Social drinkers didn't go into the bucket shop, by the way, it should be on the who me. And sometimes I would get kind of sloppy and I would slur my words. And, and I was in such denial, somebody would say, well, Gail, you're slurring your words. And I'd say, no, I'm not. It's just that I'm, I, I, I'm just talking so fast. Uh, I'm so intelligent that uh, uh, my intelligence can't keep up with my mouth, you know, or my mouth can't keep up with my intelligence. So. I would just have the excuses and denial and just thought I'm not as bad as the other people I see. But this particular night I went out drinking where I was known as Rose Lady. Now, when you get a title Rose Lady, you know you're somebody. And uh, I was drinking and that night I went into a blackout that I think only Walt Disney could do justice. I mean, it's bizarre what you do in a blackout. And for the ladies that are here tonight, you know there's nothing too attractive about a woman who's had too much to drink. There's just not. And uh, when you have to be told the next day, but this particular night, I really did a lot of stupid things. And I, as I was coming out of the blackout, I thought I gotta do something about, the, I didn't think I was alcoholic, by the way. I mean, come on, I got this car and this house and this good job. How can I be alcoholic? What is an alcoholic? But I sure didn't want another one of these nights where I had, I was powerless over my behavior and I had to be told and I couldn't control myself. And so I picked up the phone and called Alcoholics Anonymous. And the lady on the other end of the phone said, well, Gail, um, don't drink and meet us, uh, meet us at a meeting uh, that night. And uh, during the day I went out to the mall and they were giving haircuts there for $5 for the Cancer Society. And, um, I got up on stage because I'm bargain addicted and I got my hair cut for five bucks. And while I was sitting in this barber's chair, I, and parents and, you know, I told you I was a school teacher and the parents and the kids are all around this stage. And the girl sitting in the chair next to me said, were you at Stouffer's the other night? And I said, yes, I was. And she said, boy, were you drunk. I don't think I ever saw anybody so drunk. And I'm telling you, if that hadn't happened, I might not have gone to the meeting because you know that haircut made me feel a little better. I think that was divine intervention because the guilt and the shame from the night before, you remember when it used to just sweep over you in little bits and pieces? Oh, thank God I've never had to experience that in 42 years. But it got me to my first meeting. And I want to tell you about my first meeting. There weren't many women sober in Akron, Ohio in 78. But that night there was a woman who spoke. 
I remember she had cat's eye glasses. And I remember there was a lot of laughter in the room and she talked about blackouts. And that was just enough for me to relate to want to come back. And it, it wasn't long, I went to a couple meetings and what happened to me was I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous before I even knew I was alcoholic. I fell in love with the love, the vibration, the acceptance, the examples of something. I had gone to church, I had, I never saw examples of God like I saw in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I, I was just as impressed with the men um, who showed feelings and I thought, wow, they've got something here. And I hope I am an alcoholic because <laughs> I really wanted to belong to something so wonderful. And I've not ever lost that love for Alcoholics Anonymous. There is nothing in my mind like Alcoholics Anonymous. In 42 years, I've always looked forward, not back. And if there's newcomers in the room, um, I always say, don't look back or you'll go back. There's a lot to look forward to in Alcoholics Anonymous. So uh, I think back on the first meeting, it's precious to me because they're all gone now. Those beautiful men and women who carried the message, those early pioneers that devoted their lives uh, very seriously with such deep respect for this gift. Because, you know, I was only 43 years old. We're still doing 12-step calls. We're still going to St. Thomas Hospital and putting the new guy in. In the 70s, we brought them into our home. I mean, this was a very alive kind of thing with AAs running it. It wasn't treatment centers running it. Alcoholics Anonymous ran it. And if, if you did put somebody in a hospital, it was the alcoholics in the hospital that ran it. And so um, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I learned that there was nothing so bad that a drink would make it better. Um, I learned about slogans. You know, they, you know, in Akron, we, since it started in Akron, since it's the birthplace, they were really big on slogans. And I had no tools to run my life. And, and the first tool they gave me was the serenity prayer. Oh, it had, never, <laughs> it had never occurred to me to accept the things I can't change. Moan, complain, you know, uh, self-pity, all that. But never to accept what freedom that prayer alone continues to bring me on a daily basis. First things first was a big slogan at that time. Priorities, who had priorities? My priority was life should be a party and anything that got in the way of that drink, I resented. And, and AA became my priority and it continues to be my priority. You know, one of the things they stressed a lot was this is life and death. It had never occurred to me. It had never occurred to me that I could have been the one to hit the school bus. I, listen, when I was driving, sometimes I'd see four lanes, you know, I never knew which lane to pick. Um, I had a real knack for double vision. I remember one time going out to one of our entertainment centers, it's an outside entertainment center, and I had been drinking at this event, and all of a sudden, Joan Baez, that really dates me now, doesn't it? Joan Baez came on the stage, and I was with my roommate, and I nudged her, and I said, who's that girl singing with Joan Baez that has the same color dress on she has? And here I was again seeing double with Joan Baez. So drinking and driving, good God, thank you God, uh, that I was protected uh, from the, the crazy things that alcohol told me to do. Um, kind of a reckless abandonment that I had going on. So coming in and, um, Live and let live, good God, I was carrying everybody's story, but had no idea what was going on with me. Uh, all those that were steps in freedom. Um, so I ended up, there weren't a lot of women that would actually talk to me. Now I know that sounds shocking, but they were with their husbands and I was young and apparently I was a threat. <laughs> um, <laughs> The men were more than willing to talk to me, but some of the women didn't. And it was, a di but I could hear the message from the podium. And I could feel the love in the room. And, I, and, and my, my sister's husband's mother was in the program. She met me in the parking lot and she gave me the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm one of those people that I, I fell in love with the book too. 
I read it line for line, and tonight you read the chapter, How It Works, and in there is all the directions. I've heard people say, I ask, sometimes ask people, what happened? Why did you slip? Oh, my sponsor didn't take me through the steps. Well, you have a big book that'll take you through the steps line by line. If you read it and contemplate, it'll take you right into the arms of a higher power. And that's what happened to me. I would come home from work at night and I would, I would go to meetings. I went to a lot of meetings and I would read the book. And I love the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's our text and, and, and um, I think it's as relevant today as it was when it was written um, early on. So um, I love chapter five. Um, this is where the design for living that really works. Um, it still works today for me. I was agnostic when I came in. I had memorized all the sentences, but I'd long, I'd long ago left the church. I, um, I didn't believe anymore. Um, I had turned my face uh, to the light. And uh, because of the examples of Alcoholics Anonymous and those beautiful men and women who would talk, not from a podium and not preach, but share with their example how important it is that we share our experience uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I began to trust. I began to trust that maybe I had missed that. And there was a, what I had missed was a personal relationship with God. That it wasn't outside, it wasn't in the, necessarily in the tabernacle or in the priest or the, that it was in me. And I could have that relationship. Is that not what the Oxford group brought us? Is that not what we get? that changed, I mean, you think back in 1935, that really wasn't much of a belief system, but this thought system entered the world that you could have a personal relationship that you are, he is the father and I am his child and I can have a relationship with him. And I began to build on that relationship with him, but I didn't know who God was. So I thought, well, God is good. So I began to look, and this was, you know, a good victim does not look for what is good. And so, hi, Steve Ryan, I just saw you. Um, so I, I started counting what's right, what's good. And lo and behold, see, I was the kind of person that if I got a flat tire, that called for suicide. And I, just, I was just so full of drama. You know, in my home, there was a lot of drama. I was the drama. When I couldn't make it for homecoming queen in high school, I decided I'll be drama queen. So when I started an old, old, crusty old, old timer from King School came up to me, cigarette hanging out of her mouth, and she said, count three things you're grateful for. I went to go do that, and I found that difficult. I wasn't grateful for anything. So I counted the three things I was grateful for, and I began to feel a shift in myself. And so then if something went wrong in the day, well, in one hand, I had that gratitude. And that became a real important some of my early steps in the program. And then the more good I could see and the more gratitude I had, the more God I could trust because it was gonna take some trust if I was gonna be able to do the third step. If you could turn your life and your will over, my God was a punishing God. My God was gonna, was gonna give me leprosy or I don't know what he was gonna do. You know, those saints I had read about. The, I have to tell you, my patron saint at my grade school was St. Sebastian's. And Saints, and I'm a little kid and I'm walking past the statue of St. Sebastian's. And St. Sebastian's has got about 18 arrows sticking out of him with blood running down because he turned his life and will over, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking, if you turn your life and your will over, something disastrous is gonna happen to you. And that's not gonna be much fun at all. But then I learned of God's love and, um, and I trusted Alcoholics Anonymous. So. Um, I thought well before taking that step, which I think is an important line in the big book. I didn't make a decision to go to four. I really, really, really had to take a look at this step and the fears that I had that were holding me back before I could make that surrender. And to me, that's what a lot of the steps are about. It's just surrender, just surrender. Um, and so um, I began to look at this fourth step. I launched into the fourth step. And I celebrate that step today, that's the freedom. I mean, they're all freedom, but man, you don't get out of it. There's no way out without the fourth step, you know, because I never took responsibility for myself. It was always somebody else's fault. I never looked at me, I looked at you. And so turning that around and, and being honest, open and willing to take a look at me was shocking 
you know, I always wanted to be perfect because I thought, you know, if I'm perfect, then you'll love me. But then I kind of looked and saw that I was holding everybody else to some standard of perfection as well. And I didn't know of anybody that was perfect. Um, again, the, the victim thinking was there. I had just, I saw that I was emotionally retarded. I had failed to grow up. You know, even though I had left home physically, I left my house at 21. I'm drinking at 29, but up here, I never left home. In my mind, I never left home. I'm still back there. I'm still in the past. And I had that suitcase, right? So now I'm going to open up the suitcase and I'm going to write down everything that I've been walking around with for all those years. And, um, but the new thing was that I was going to accept responsibility for my, my part in it. Um, one of the things that um, I had so much fear, because not only was I living in the past and, and couldn't get free of that, I had this fear of the future, the, the, the Jaws thing. And, and what would make me do is my mind would race. So like if I was doing, if I was fixing dinner, I was thinking about doing the wash. If I was doing the wash, I was thinking about mowing the lawn. If I was mowing the lawn, I was never, I was just, right? And then I'd go to go to bed at night and my mind would think about, well, what if this, well, well what if this happens? Well, what if this happens? I was a good worrier. And um, so this was a very big step for me to own my own behavior. And, um, take my own inventory. Um, and so, you know, I kept a list of all the people who had harmed me and I was waiting for them to make amends. Uh, remember when you're a little kid and they say to you, well, I remember my neighbor was Tommy Jones and, and maybe I did something and my mom would say, now you go over and you apologize to Tommy Jones for what you did. You remember when your parents would do this and make you apologize? Well, I wasn't sorry at all and I just hated that forced apology that, that parental figures would make you make. But you know, this step is another freeing step to make amends, to admit when you're wrong. Um, because I was, my past was chasing me. I never wanted it to catch up with me. I ran from the truth and my mindset created delusion. Today, I actually run to the truth. I'm not afraid of the truth. I'm not afraid of criticism. I, Jesus, I was so filled with my own self-criticism, you couldn't have said a word to me. I couldn't have handled it. And now I'm like, I don't have to be perfect. You know, I can love myself. That's a, and we don't talk about it very much in AA, but I've come to the point in my later stages of working this program that self-love, loving myself and accepting myself with my character defects and not running with that shame because I'm so imperfect has, um, uh, has changed my dependencies that I used to have on other people. You know, um, it's, you know, I'm the love I've been waiting for. Um, I'm the love. And when you get, you know, first part of the program, you, you, you get um, uh, a relationship with, with the AA and a higher power. And then later on, I got a relationship with myself. I have a self. And, um, so the maintenance steps for me are 10, 11, and 12. And um, that's like going to the gym and working out. You know, it's like practicing these principles in all our affairs is like, kind of like practicing spiritual principles. It's kind of, and sometimes those weights are heavy when you pick them up. But if you practice, it does get easier. And it's become an adventure. What was once an outside trip, every day is an inside trip. I get 24 hours. And in that 24 hours, um, I get a curriculum because I turned my life and my will over in step three. So I trust now that things are happening for me, not to me. I just need to ask what is the lesson and be willing to surrender to the lesson and be willing to allow the things that happen. It's sort of like, I, I sometimes say I follow breadcrumbs, you know, it's like, oh, this is what's up today. This is what the curriculum is today. It's a spiritual trip. It's a spiritual adventure. Um, and so, um, all right, so part of that 10, 11, and 12, I suppose, is service, right? And uh, Carl mentioned that um, I, uh, I'm in Akron and they weren't taking care of the history. Uh, they were doing a lot of 12-step work, God bless them, but they 
didn't understand the significance of the history. Um, it's like carrying the message in Akron meant answering the phone, and they went wrong. That was a big part of the early days in Akron. They told me to get active, and so I ended up on the board of our intergroup office, and I'm pretty young in sobriety when I do. And um, I'm going to check the time here to see how much time I've got. Oh, we've got a few minutes. Um, so we have Founders Day every year. How many of you have ever been to Founders Day? You've been to Founders Day, some of you? Okay, not all of you. Well, let me tell you what. Founders Day was started in about 45. Uh, Bob and Bill used to come to Akron and we'd throw a party. And that was to celebrate Dr. Bob's last drink. It's around June 10th. And of course, Bob and Ann are gone and Bill dies in 71, but Lois is still coming. And they say, Gail, would you be willing to host Lois Wilson? And um, I didn't know what a host was. Today, I, I speak in Alcoholics Anonymous and get around a little bit, so I have, I've been hosted. But at that time, I did not know. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? I went, my Lois Wilson, what am I supposed to do? They said, well, she's coming in with some of her companions and you're gonna seat her. Uh, so at the, they had like a breakfast and Lois came in with Barry and we're going to seat, I seated her up above the dais and I had a table for her companions right below because she's real tiny and fragile and uh, I wanted her to be able to see her companions and so I said, um, uh, I'm, I'm, as I'm seating them, this woman says, hello, my name is Nell Wing. And she's very bubbly and very open. And she said, I was with Bill Wilson when he wrote the 12 and 12. I was his secretary. And um, gosh, you know, in those cartoons where you see somebody's eyeballs kind of come out, roll around and go back in. I mean, I, that must have been how I looked. It was like, oh my God, I'm talking to Nell Wing. And this was so exciting to me. And there happened to just be an empty seat and I was invited to sit down with them. And so Nell, being very friendly, we continued to talk. And I said to her, um, Lois's book, Lois Remembers, had just come out. And I said to her, I said, well, um, she was going to get a signed copy for me. And I said, oh, thank you so much, Nell. If there's ever anything I can do for you, just ask. Now watch when you say that in Alcoholics Anonymous, if any of you are in service. I know California's got a lot of service. I love all your commitments out there. Well, anyway, um, I said, what's that? She said, I'd like you to start an archives. And I didn't know what an archives was. I really didn't. I had no idea. I have some smelly old papers maybe in Washington. But based on my third step where I turned my life and my will over and I wanted to be of maximum service in Alcoholics Anonymous. But they weren't taking care of the history and I personally felt my mother was an antique dealer and she had sold off our family heirlooms. And actually at that time, everything was being sold out of Akron so fast. Collectors and things like that were really interested in it. Most of the old timers didn't know it and things were just flying out. And so um, the next thing that happened to me, I'm down at Stan Hewitt where the Gate Lodge is where Bob and Bill met. And I found Dr. Bob's Oxford group book signed by him in an old book bin. And I thought, gee, it's so sad. We have no place to put this book. We need a repository. Shortly after that, I'm at an old timer's funeral and I was asked to be a part of purchasing Dr. Bob's home. And I went to the second meeting of that group and I was chosen to be the one to negotiate the purchase on Dr. Bob's home. And that would have been in 1984. So in 1984, I uh, got into service with Dr. Bob's home and um, held, I, I negotiated a cold call, cold call, negotiated the contract, held the contract in my name. And I, meanwhile, flew to New York and said, okay, now we've got the house. I'll put the archives in the house. And she said, Gail, AA can't own property. Oh, no, don't tell me that. My job, I thought, was done. I'll put it in the house. There'll be property, money, and prestige. Done deal. 
but she said if you want to be an AA archivist, you'll need to, um, AA can't own property, so therefore, and eventually I decided to leave that the home, Dr. Bob's home at that time, and try to start an archives in Akron under the three legacies. And, and that's just something I want to share with you. I, I talked briefly about the 12 steps, but I believe AA isn't just about 12 steps. It's about 12 traditions and 12 concepts. And if you add the warranties, we're talking about 41 principles. And because of the service work that I've done in Akron, because I was eventually able to, uh, oh, took 10 years of walking and felt like John the Baptist out there trying to, to drum up interest in taking care of our history. There was just not a lot of support for it the first 10 years and probably the first 20 years. But eventually they decided to give me an old broken dumpy room in our archives. And um, we were able to establish an archives that stands today. If any of you ever come to Akron, um, I hope you'll stop by our office. There are 26 displays there. And uh, we walk you through the full history of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then 10 years ago, and, and I gotta tell you, I know, I, don't, I know I'm preaching to the choir. If I'm talking about California, I know that you folks are active in service to Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, you guys are on fire with service. And so I really believe people cheat themselves out of the full deal um, by not getting in service and applying those principles that can apply to your own personal life. It changes you. It's just rich. It's just rich. And so um, there wasn't a lot of unity among archivists. And so I believe in unity and I believe in that circle. And so we were able to hold the first National AA Archives Workshop in 1996 at the Mayflower Hotel. And, to the, and so archivists from all over the country now are united. We're still going strong. And um, I'm actually on the board with Steve Ryan that's on this call. And uh, uh, we try to help train archivists to care for our history. And if you were to come to Akron, I then returned to the board after 15 years of service at our office. I went back to Dr. Bob's house because it had collapsed and um, helped to restructure it and did all the display work and that. And what that life has done for me, uh, it's my joy. It's my joy when you come to Akron to be on the front porch and did say, welcome home. It is my joy when you come, if I'm home. Now, I'm not home this year. I'm in Florida right now because of the pandemic, but it's been my life for 42 years. Uh, most of those 42 years have been in service to preserving the history in Akron. And I think the longer we go into the future, the more important those early lessons are, the more important those lives and the sacrifices that were made. We don't ever want to take this thing for granted. Um, I, I carry those old timers with me. I know what they did to keep those doors open. I know about the sacrifices they made and um, I wanna keep their stories alive um, and the truth so that it doesn't become myth. So um, I think, is that it? I think that's, yeah. Um, I think I, maybe I was supposed to go a little longer, but um, if you wanna know more about the history, you can visit Dr. Bob online you can visit our website at our office, but there's nothing uh, as great as a um, actual visit uh, to Dr. Bob's home. So I just want to close with saying that the promises have come true for me. You know, when I first came in, and I remember when I read them to my sister the first night I did a 12-step call on her, man, rather than look back, I've always looked forward to these promises being fulfilled, and they have been fulfilled in my life. Um, I do comprehend the word serenity, and I do know peace today. I don't have peace all the time, but I know where it's at. I know to put the pause in. I know to put the prayer in. I know to reach for the phone. I know how to get there if I get out of whack. Uh, that pause has become so important to me because I'm such a, I'm such a reactor. Every day I have to work on emotional sobriety because it's just how I'm wired, you know? I trigger and it's part of the damage that I carry and, and it's getting better by, uh, by practicing these principles. Um, I love that 
we will not regret the past in which to shut the door on. The past is a gift. And what I love about Alcoholics Anonymous is you can learn from my past or I can learn from your past. And we don't have to run from it because I did. I, I, I never wanted to turn around and face some of the things I did in my drinking years. And now I can share those things with others. What a gift, what a gift the past is. Um, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That's what I just said. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. I'm not a victim today. If I even see a thought come in my way of a victim, victims drink. It's a lie. I'm not buying that lie again, and I'm not creating the story. Something might happen. I might even get a resentment. You know, the book doesn't say we won't get resentments. It just says, just don't justify them. I just don't tell myself these victim stories uh, that seem to fit what I, I think and cause me to be delusional. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity disappear. We'll lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. My life of service has been the greatest joy of my life. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. I have to laugh at this. I would sit at my kitchen table with a bottle of Papa Kribari. I was in my 20s and I was so afraid of financial stuff that I would be thinking about retirement. Now, if that isn't cuckoo. And I would, and I would need the alcohol to help wrestle down the fears of this economic insecurity. Um, we want to really know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. What a gift, what a gift AA is. And we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. I'm not alone anymore. I have a higher power. That God can help me. I just have to be willing to reach out and ask for that help. Self-reliance failed me over and over again. My way did not work. If you're having any trouble with this program, just take a look at what you did with your thinking and listen to the examples of people that changed their minds. And, and uh, so I thank you all for listening. Uh, it was my, my very first debut was telling my story. I'm much more comfortable doing history, but thank you.